Uh, what better, what better sort of environment to do that? The Emirates Airline Festival of Literature, uh, Isabel Abelhold and all her team have helped create this platform uh, in previous years, a platform that is growing um, year after year, not just in numbers turning up, as you've seen out there in the lobby, but equally in the subjects that are being discussed freely within rooms amongst educated people. And uh, one of those very educated people is alongside me now, kindly going to answer your questions, but just want to pick up on a few points that you mentioned there. Um, your history of defending human rights, not just here in the UAE, but across the region, across the world, is well documented. You have been outspoken on these subjects on time and time again. We saw you speaking in New York about it earlier. You've been invited to speak on this subject around the world. You spoke about it here today. Uh, you've written numerous articles about why is it that human rights for you is a subject that instills such passion? Well, uh, my not keynote speak on uh, C3. Is it working? If you can just pull it up, it's working, yeah, but if you can just pull it up to the mouth a little bit further, yeah, that's great. My keynote speak, uh, speech on New York was about democracy and the human right, and I was comparing my country, only I can talk about my country, United Arab Emirates, compared to the big city in the world. And I showed them how we are happy, how we are taking care of our people, and we are trying to educate as much as we can. We take care of their health, we take care of this. I was with the President Carter. I invited him, we attended College University, uh, sorry, Illinois College, and we are speaking about all these subjects. And what is the, it was a question raised to me by the dean of the university after my speech, we were three people on the panels. She said, what do you think after the attack of Israel and the attack of Gaza to Israel, what, was, what do you think of the economy of Gaza? I was laughing. I said, there is, originally there is no, no, no economy. There is, I mean, I, I said to them, in front of President Carter, there were about 2,000 people on the sta uh, in the stadium and maybe 18,000 outside because they couldn't get place. And I said that, well, they have no economy. I was laughing. They are starving. They are tired. They are fed up. Uh, you have to remember something that I am against Hamas, against the way they are acting because they are part of uh, militia, Iranian militia, which I don't like and I don't respect. And, uh, but the problem during that, I said, Israel was butchering children, men, and women, and the White House and the president was funding them with the money and supplying them with the arm. Everybody was laughing, everybody was clapping. They stand three times. Not as much as they stand for Netanyahu 40 times, but three times enough for me. <laughs> Thank you, yes. It, it's interesting because one of the sort of uh, the, the, the foundations that you look to defend uh, and look to promote is freedom of speech. You are a breath of fresh air. You're somebody who speaks his opinion. When it comes to human rights, freedom of speech is very important to you, specifically here in the United Arab Emirates. And it sort of strikes me as you couldn't think of a better place to exemplify that than an event like this, where we are discussing subject, subjects which other people would seem to see as taboo. So freedom of speech is important, is it not? 100% freedom of speech, we learn from when we were little. When I was little with my father riding camels, and we sit with the ruler, Sheikh Rashid, late Rashid, we speak everything in our heart. We are used to that. We, we, uh, our father, grandfather taught us to speak frankly, but not to insult people. You have to be polite, you have to question anything to the leader of the country, but in light. Democracy, I mean, a lot of people in the Arab world, unfortunately, use democracy to abuse people and to talk a lot of nonsense. This is unacceptable. I will never recommend it. I will never like it to have it in my country. And no, we are approaching our people, our leaders from day one, face to face, and we can tell them what is wrong and what is right, and they are listening to us, and we are working together for the growth and security and safety of my country. It, 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 it's a point that comes across in, in, in your speech. It's a point that comes across in your, in your writings as well. And you so eloquently put it there about um, your, your, your defense of marriage support, your defense of women's rights, the support that the government here and across the region is 
given it. Do you think that with regards to that, with regards to women's rights, and you spoke about it, about the Human Rights Watch report, the recent one, uh, and the lies that you deem to come out of that, do you think there is a, a misunderstanding when people uh, talk about women's rights in the region? I think, I mean, I can't talk about the women in my country. I cannot talk about the women in GCC. I don't know because I haven't been there, you know, to any place in GCC, I have to admit. But the women in my country, they are well respected, they are well taken care of. I mean, we have member of parliaments, we have professor in the universities, women, the head of university, Dr. Rafi'a Ghaba, she was the head of the Arabian Gulf University in Bahrain, which we are, I am proud of this lady here in front of me, and so many professor and doctor. In a, plus, we have ministers, ladies, they are executive ladies, chief executive. I mean, in negotiation of, uh, of what you call the uh, uh, 2020, the expo. I mean, one of our lady, she played a main role in negotiation, and I'm proud of her. She is one of our women, women in front all the time. I mean, we grew, the Islamic religion taught us to respect women and to put them in front as well. Yeah. During Prophet Muhammad, they were fighting as well in war. Yeah. Now they don't want to fight. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, I'd like to talk for a moment, if I may, about the media. I know we've got a number of the members of the media with us here at the moment. You are uh, very prolific when it comes to. Uh, contributing to the media, whether that be through written media, whether it be through the mobile applications that we saw a little earlier on, your website, which is updated um, very regularly, um, and also more recently on social media as well. We all know that social media is, has, a, has had a massive impact in recent years. It is changing the agenda, the way that news is being reported the world over. I'm interested to get your sort of take on social media and the state of social media in the region at the moment. I think, I think the, pe the Arab people in general, they need education. They need to be told how to use the social media or the media. You should not abuse people. You should not take, I mean, the differences is accepted. I mean, if I am saying something and you are in disagreement of it, you can say you're in disagreement because I was ex I'm expecting that not everything you are in agreement with me, but you should not use bad words. You should use a respectable, you should, attack but in a good professional way i mean unfortunately social media and the Arab world fail because of so many people which they have no respect for other and no respect to the opinion of the other which i don't really agree with them this is number one as far as far as the social media is concerned as far as the media in general it is restricted in the arab world especially everywhere I, I think, except in the siyasa, where Ahmed al Allah, <laughs> he has the best newspaper, I think, in the Arab world, or what, what he can write, he can write freely, and I can write there. Well, uh, when I write on something, sometimes some paper, they don't accept it, which is fair enough. This is up to them. I mean, they are free, and uh, I'm not forcing them. They will be happy. I mean, they have to be honored to publish any article I write, but Mr. al Allah, he published it and uh, he accepted, which is, Ahmed Jarallah, I think you are the best <laughs> editor-in-chief. <laughs> One piece of criticism that uh, social media comes in for is the, uh, uh, the lack of censorship available on uh, social media. Is that a concern for you as well? I mean, I mean, there is some people, they are not entitled really to, to the social media, as I said, they, they don't understand what social media. I mean, social media, in my opinion, something to write, I mean, positive. Something to comment, something you have the right to comment negative or uh, against that thing, you know. But you should not talk in a lot of unpolite way. I mean, I'm not against, against social media, I'm not against media, we need it, we need people to write. We need people to write the truth. We need people to say, if I am worried for my country's GCC or the Arab world, I have to warn my leaders to tell them where I am worried. I am not a writer, I write when I feel. 
I write when I'm worried. I write when I'm scared. This is what happened. I am not a writer. Like a lot of people, like Mr. Jarallah or Mr. Hussein, Abu Ghafar Hussein, they write because they know how to write. I write when I am scared. I write when I'm worried. I write when I want to warn people and to warn my leaders that what's happening, what's coming. Like what's happening for in Yemen, Iraq, uh, Syria, uh, Lebanon, uh, Libya. This is Egypt. This is what it worries, you know, me. This is, I want to cautious them. I want to caution to make them think that we need a protection and we have to be always taken and to buy a take before I get the uh, get ill. You know, antibiotic. We need to take antibiotic. We have to go there before they come to us. Just picking up on that point, uh, and it's something that you feel so passionate about, uh, media <clears throat> in the region and that sort of demand for the truth to be told. You have some great leaders of media in this room at the moment. What would be your advice to the media, the Arab media, the media in the region moving forward at the moment? I think... <clears throat> In the media, we have to be very honest. The editor-in-chief of any paper or magazine or TV, whatever, I don't know what, where, what their titles, they have to put, if I have enemy, I have to mention the enemy. I should not worry. I, I, will, I have to pinpoint to the enemy, that's my enemy. They should not erase a paragraph or word or words on your uh, speech or on your article. This is the media, this is the true media. I mean, if you, if you look to the Fox uh, TV, which a lot of people doesn't like Fox, they are criticizing President Obama every single minute, not hours, minute. And they are pinpointing, they are not talking bad, they are with the backing, with the facts. This is what the media we want, we want, we have enemies, we have to mention they are our enemies and we should not say, no, they are our friend historically. No, they are our enemy. This is what I believe personally, you know. I There's no compromise on the safety. Yeah. No compromise in the security of the country. No compromise in security of our people, our children and grandchildren. Mm. Yeah. Just want to draw your attention quickly before we move on to the lifetime achievement uh, and recognizing the life, the works, portfolio, the canon of a great friend of yours. Uh, we'll be doing that in just a few seconds' time. But just a couple of points that have cropped up. Uh, one of your uh, latest articles, I think one of the latest article, uh, is that about uh, Prime Minister Erdogan of uh, Turkey. Uh, it's something that uh, is on, on the website at the moment. Erdogan doesn't deserve a Saudi red carpet is the headline on that one. This has caused a huge amount of uh, debate in the region at the moment. Um, for good reason, and as you've just said, and quite rightly, it is deserved, that debate uh, at present. Um, tell me, though, about the wider implications uh, of the comments that you make in this piece and the relationship between the UAE, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. Well, we are, uh, I mean, in, in, in UAE and Saudi Arabia, we are putting the brotherhood into the blacklist at terrorism. And... Uh, you know, Egypt is the most important country to the Arab world. And I was disappointed when I see Erdogan attacking Egypt and attacking the legal uh, elected president, the majority of 30 million people they were on the, on the, uh, outside their home, electing them, and he said this is a revolution. Plus, he did not join I mean, I mean, it didn't work against Daesh. Plus, all, I mean, all the injured, all, all the people was uh, treated in the hospitals. This is what we read in the media. I'm not uh, saying that. We read in the media, in all media in the world. Plus, it is the transit from the Europe of fighters coming from all into, to join Daesh for training. This is what upset me. We are, we have to be honest. I mean, we have enemies surrounding us and we have to be careful and we have to be alert and we, we know who's our enemies. Yeah. It, it's a piece that has garnered response uh, at the Arab Times, uh, publishing an open letter yes. from the Turkish ambassador. He's entitled to his opinion as well. 100%, 100%. 
Yes, and I entitled my answer also to him. It was in the paper. I didn't know whether you read it or not. Indeed, I did. Yes, yeah, indeed, I, I did. I answered him as well. <laughs> it was also in the Arab Times. Quite right, yeah. too. And, but again, this is part and parcel of the discussion yeah. that you want to happen at the moment. Yes. Yes. Let's uh, move on to another of the uh, pieces that has got a lot of people talking. And you mentioned Yemen a little earlier on and the role of the Houthis in Yemen. It's something that you foresaw in one of your pieces uh, many years ago, many months ago, and have been many, many warnings for. What are your, your thoughts? What are the dangers of the border in Yemen? Well, and I, I wrote four articles, and uh, three articles, and the fourth is my final to remind our... I mean, I was worried because the Yemen is in the border of Saudi Arabia and in the border of Oman. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's the most dangerous, and I wrote so many articles on the last few years, not only this year, I mean 2014 and 2015, that we have to go and, you know, as I said earlier, to have the antibiotic before the flu comes to us yeah. and, uh, you know, to, and uh, al Houthiin is fueled by Iran, uh, fueled and supported by Iran to do whatever, and the Iranian, they said that in public, they said, we took over Lebanon, we took over Syria, we took over Iraq, we took over Yemen. They said that this country has been taken, or in particular, they say the capital. When you take a capital, you take everything else. Therefore, and I don't want them to be my neighbors. I don't want them to be next to my barriers. I mean, not enough I am fencing between me and that. That's not enough. I have the right. I don't need to take approval from anywhere in the world, from the West in particular. I have to protect myself, I have to protect my people, I, don't, I have to protect my country, which is the GCC. Therefore, we have to help the legal government of Yemen, we have to interfere by any means, I'm not a military man, any means to protect ourselves in Iraq to make a peace on settlement, and also we have to help the free army in Syria to throw the, the biggest criminal on earth, Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. There is one final question I'd like to make, and then I know there are a number of questions from the floor. Um, I'm just fascinated to get your opinions and thoughts, Khalif, if I can, on um, uh, a speech that was given on Capitol Hill uh, not so long ago. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has uh, raised eyebrows the world over. What did you make of his speech in America? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some people, Dr. Rafi, will not be happy. <laughs> uh, well, I think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, definitely, in my opinion, he, he is a criminal against Palestinian men, women, and children, but I have to respect this man as a leader of Israel. I have to respect him the way he approached the American. I have to say that when he went to the Congress and he delivered his speech, he delivered it as a leader. He was speaking honest to protect his country, to respect, and he threatened Iran, and he was worried about the threat of Iran. And he is far distance from Iran. We are closer to Iran. And he was delivering, even he come bypass the White House to go to the power, to go to the power, the powerful parliament in earth, the, rule, the ruling the world. And he was warning them, and he didn't beg them. He's, he is telling them the truth. We are, must be honest. We have to say whatever we feel. We should tell them what's wrong and what's right in their country. And I will tell you something. The American people, the best people you'll ever meet in your life. The people, I'm talking about people, them. I'm not talking about the White House. White House, which I'm not happy about it as a person. I know they don't care whether I'm happy or not happy, but I'm not. The people, the American, the best people, and they are listening. If we go, to where Netanyahu went, and we are, we know how to walk the way the American walk, and we know how to wear 
the suit and the tie and the handkerchief, the way the American walk, they will respect us. And we should not lie. We tell them the truth. If they are wrong, we have to say you are wrong. You treated us bad and this and this and that. We can't trust you as friend anymore. They will respect that. Uh, respect is, is, is a lovely word to, 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 to sort of wrap up my little bit here.